And the hours of registration are from 9 to 5 until this Friday. Be sure to register so you can vote. The preceding was a presentation of the West Side Civic Club. Well, you can go to the registrar or voter's office in the courthouse. But it just so happens that the deputy registration officers will be in your neighborhood next Tuesday afternoon. Would you prefer that I have them call at your house? But I registered when we moved here last year. Do I have to register again? You must register before you can vote. You can register with your neighborhood deputy registrar, or you can register at your local courthouse in the office of the Registrar of Voters. May I help you? Is this where I register to vote? Yes. Have you ever voted in the county before? No, I just moved here the first of the year. Have you lived in the state for the last six months? Yes. Have you lived in the county for the past 60 days? Yes. Have you lived in your precinct for the last 30 days? Yes. All states have residence requirements. Such requirements vary from state to state. Your name? David B. Collins. And your address? 617 Northside Drive. You're in Precinct 7, and your polling place is Maple Grove School. Where were you born? Dayton, Ohio. Your age? 42. Sign on this line. When you sign the registration form, you testify that the information on the form is correct. With your signature, this form becomes the official record of your qualification to vote. Loss of registration results from changing your residence and in some states from failure to vote or from the periodic expiration of the registration list. If for any of these reasons you lose your registration, you must re-register. When you cannot register in person, you may register by mail. Upon application, a registration form is mailed to you. When properly filled out and returned to the registrar, it is entered with the other official registration records. These individual records are used to make up the voting list. Only the persons whose names are on the completed voting list are qualified to receive a ballot on election day. Ballots may be different in color, size, shape, and detail from state to state, but the ballot you receive on election day will probably be one of two general types, the party column type, sometimes called the Indiana ballot, or the office group type, sometimes called the Massachusetts ballot. On paper ballots of the office group type, the candidates are listed under the heading of the office they are seeking. Their party affiliations usually follow their names. On the voting machine, the office heading is also above the name of the party candidate. However, on the party column ballot, you will find a different arrangement. On this type of ballot, the candidates' names are listed in a column under their party heading. This arrangement of candidates' names is the same as on the voting machine, except that on the paper ballot, the party column reads vertically. On the machine panel, the party column reads horizontally. The details of marking ballots vary from state to state. However, instructions are clearly stated on every ballot. Read them carefully and follow them exactly. Special voting instructions may be given for some sections of the ballot. They refer only to that part of the ballot. The ballots of most states provide blank squares beside each candidate's name. To vote for a candidate, make a cross X within the square opposite his name. 
a properly marked ballot might look like this. Some states provide a special means of making your mark, such as this rubber stamp. The proper marking equipment for your state will be supplied by the officials at the polls. Ballots may be disqualified in many states if a check or a plus mark is used. Even the cross X may be disqualified if the lines do not cross inside the square. If the lines do not cross to complete an X. Or if they extend outside the square. Here is the accepted mark for your ballot. You may vote a split ticket or a straight ticket. Voting a straight ticket means that you vote for all the candidates of one political party. When you choose candidates from more than one party, you are voting a split or scratch ticket. When marking a split ticket, you must vote for each candidate individually. You may also vote a straight ticket by marking an X after each name. However, on the party column ballot of many states, you may vote a straight ticket by placing a single X within the party name or symbol at the top of the ballot. When you vote in this circle, it is the only mark you need to make, and all of the candidates whose names appear in the column will receive your vote. Many states permit a write-in vote so that a voter may add a candidate's name to the ballot. Since the techniques for a write-in vary, ask your election board about the correct procedure in your state. A referendum on public measures such as constitutional amendments may be included on the ballot or may be on separate ballots. Read the instructions carefully before you vote on the issue. Machines are used for voting in many places. As on the paper ballot, you can vote either a split or straight ticket. You may have decided to vote a straight ticket. After you have closed the curtains, pull the lever of your party. This action exposes an X by each name of your party's candidates. Your vote is cast when you open the curtains with the operating lever. The tabs are also cleared and the secrecy of your vote is guaranteed. There are two ways of voting a split ticket on the machine. Let's suppose most of the candidates you select belong to one political party. First, pull the operating lever to the opposite position. Next, pull the party lever of that party which includes the majority of your chosen candidates. Then push up the pointer where you wish to vote for another candidate and pull down the pointer of your new choice. Before you make a new choice, make sure all the pointers for that office are pushed up. Otherwise, the machine will not allow you to vote for your new choice. Now you have made your selection, but you have not yet voted. You cast your vote only when you pull the operating lever back to its original position. Your vote is then cast, the voting panel is cleared, the curtain is opened, and the booth is ready for the next voter. With the other method of voting a split ticket, you disregard the party lever and make your selections directly from the various parties by pushing down the individual pointers. For a write-in vote, lift the slide above the office and write in the name. Space for special propositions is found near the top of the voting panel. Selection is made by pushing down the proper pointer. Again, by pulling the operating handle, your vote is cast and tabulated on the automatic counters inside of the machine. If you obtain a sample ballot and study it carefully before going to the polls, you can become familiar with the ballot you will use on election day. You would then avoid feeling rushed in situations where election laws limit the time you may use to mark your ballot. On the day of either a primary or general election, you should report to the specified polling place for your precinct, unless you have already been allowed to vote by mail using an absentee ballot. 
the location of your polling place and the hours for voting are publicly announced before Election Day. If you have any questions, you may call your local election board or the local headquarters of your political party. After your name has been checked on the voting list, you may enter the polls. Only persons voting and election officials are allowed inside the polls. This is a closed primary election. When you sign for your ballot, you must declare a party affiliation. After you have received a ballot naming all the candidates seeking your party's nominations, go directly to a vacant booth to make your selections. Read the instructions carefully and make the appropriate marks. In some states, you are allowed to take your sample ballot into the booth. If you should spoil a ballot, return it with an explanation to the election officials. Then your old ballot will be voided and a new one will be issued. Remember, the officials are here not only to check your qualifications to vote, but also to protect your right to vote and to assist you with any problems. This type of election employs the Australian ballot, which means you vote in secrecy on uniform ballots provided by public authority. When you have finished marking your ballot, Fold it so that no one can see how you have voted. If there is an official seal or signature on the back of the ballot, be sure it is visible when the ballot is folded. After you leave the booth, go to the ballot boxes and deposit your ballot in the proper box or hand it to the proper official who will deposit it for you. Now let's see how you would vote in a general election in a large city where voting machines are used. You will notice that the procedure at the polls is similar to the rural primary we have just seen. Before you enter the polls, your name is checked on the voting list by representatives of the political parties. You enter the polls and the clerk checks your qualifications for voting in the registration book. Then you sign the voting book. An election official will indicate which voting machine you are to use. Remember, all you have to do to vote by machine is first pull the operating handle to the opposite side. Second, select your candidates. Use either the straight ticket method or one of the split ticket methods. Third, pull the operating handle back to its original position to cast your vote. And then what happens? Hi everybody, I'm Skip Alzheimer. Uh, welcome to our AV Geeks Lunchtime streaming show. Um, I played that film because my wife and I voted. We early voted this morning. It was actually really nice. We went in after everybody went to work, so we were there around 10:30, 11, and it took like 10 minutes, if even that. Um, it was really quick. So, everybody, um, vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but just get out and vote. I know some of you are joining us from other countries, and you don't vote during this time. You have another time that you vote, but yes, participate if you can. Um, the Prohibition Party. Wow, I uh, I've seen this film uh, once or twice, but uh, I always missed the Prohibition Party. And wow, according to Wikipedia, they still exist, and um, they have a 2020 candidate. Um, Phil Collins is his name. He's from uh, Colorado, I think. Um, <laughs> fascinating. <coughs> Phil Collins, prohibitionist. Um. Well, they did not make it on the ballot in North Carolina. I don't think they got enough signatures. So um, we pretty much had three or four. I think we had four presidential candidates to pick from. Um, all right. Well, 
We watch old 60mm educational films. And thanks to Kevin, uh, I have uh, coffee. So thank you, Kevin, for donating coffee to the AV Geeks. It's always a um, great treat slash uh, medicinal necessity uh, to keep me on track and going. So thank you for that. So this next film is about why people smoke. years ago, in the jungles of Central America, the Indians first discovered tobacco. They found they could roll up the dry leaves, put one end in the mouth, and set fire to the other end. It doesn't sound like much of an idea, putting dry leaves in your mouth and setting them on fire, and you wouldn't think it would catch on. But it did. In 1492, Columbus sailed across the ocean and he discovered tobacco. After that, Columbus sailed back home and everybody discovered tobacco all over the world. As time went by, different people discovered different things they could do with tobacco. Some people put it in their nose <coughs> and some people put it in their mouth. But most people rolled the tobacco up into little sticks called cigarettes and smoked them. The machine age came and machines were invented to make the cigarettes and even more people began to smoke. And by the time the 20th century came along, it looked like almost everybody was smoking cigarettes. Almost everybody. However, in the middle of the 20th century, Another discovery was made. Cigarettes were killing people. The doctors knew. They told people cigarettes were killing them. But nobody paid any attention. People just listened and then went right on smoking. And smoking and smoking. Why, the doctors wondered. Why? So, to find out why, a survey was taken using the well-known brain x-ray machine. This remarkable machine will show the real truth about people and not just what they say. Here is survey subject number one. Yes, it's true. Some people are like sheep. A sheep can't think for himself. He does whatever the other sheep do, even if it kills him. And some people are the same way. They just do whatever they see other people do. Some people are like sheep. So we have discovered one reason. People smoke because they are sheep. They do whatever the other sheep do, even if it kills them. <coughs> Subject number two. <coughs> It's true. Some people are dumb. Some people believe all the cigarette advertising. Cigarette manufacturers love to advertise. 
They make all sorts of different claims for cigarettes. They spend $3 billion every year trying to make people think that one way or the other, cigarettes are good. It's all a lie. The truth is cigarettes kill. Cigarettes kill one person every two minutes. But some people don't believe that. They believe the advertising. Some people are dumb. A second reason. People smoke because they are dumb. They believe cigarette advertising. Dumb. Subject number three. Yes, it's true. Some people are like little babies. A baby likes to put things in his mouth. It makes him feel good because, of course, at first that's how he's fed. So later on, he may suck his thumb, especially when he misses his mommy. But after that, most people grow up and don't want to suck their thumb anymore. But some people do. Now, of course, a grown-up person can't go around sucking his thumb. What would people say? So, instead of sucking his thumb, he lights a cigarette. And, oh, that makes him feel all better. But the thing is, you can see how smoking cigarettes isn't really all that cool or grown up. It's really just the opposite. It's like missing your mommy and feeling bad. And that's not cool. Anyway, people smoke because they are babies. Some people just don't ever grow up. <coughs> Subject number four. Yes, it's true. A lot of people are hooked on cigarettes. Tobacco is a drug, and it's habit-forming. A cigarette smoker is an addict. A junkie, just like any other junkie. He doesn't smoke because he wants to. He has to. Every day of his life, he says to himself, tomorrow, I'm going to quit. And of course, finally, one day he does. Cigarettes kill 300,000 people every year, just in the United States. More than all the wars fought by the United States put together. More than all the auto accidents. Cigarettes kill, and they're habit-forming. You think you'll stop, but you're hooked. So, the final reason, people smoke because they are hooked. You know, when you think about it, the whole idea of smoking seems kind of silly. Putting dead leaves in your mouth, setting them on fire. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, people who smoke all look kind of silly. All puffing and blowing and sucking on their cigarettes. The next time you see somebody smoking, look at them real good. See if you don't think they look kind of funny. But we shouldn't laugh at people who smoke. We should try to help them before it's too late. Because cigarettes kill. If you know somebody who smokes, you tell them that. Oh, one other thing about people who smoke. When you get up close to them, they stink.
Wow, the sheeple mention. That's hilarious. 1978. Um, not a pro-smoking film. I, I don't know if I have any pro-smoking films, um, meaning commercials. Uh, well, I, I have uh, Tobacco Land USA, which is all about manufacturing of tobacco. And you could say that that's pro-smoking. But, um, yeah, kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, this next film is, uh, it's a little long, but it's really great. Um, in the past, I've shown many uh, Moody Institute of Science films um, featuring Dr. Erwin Moon, who is a doctor not of science, but of uh, religion. And uh, his uh, sermons of science were, he would ha do some amazingly spectacular science experiment. And then he would talk about the Gospels. That was, and he would do these in churches and actually did them in a couple of pavilions at World's Fairs. Um, so he's all about the experiment. Now, what's interesting is that he'll do the experiment almost like a magic trick, but, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about science, but very quickly transitions over into talking about God. And so this next film, Sense Perception, has lots of really awesome experiments. Um, including the one about wearing upside down glasses, which uh, I have another film called uh, Living in a Reverse World, or the glasses that, make, that reverse left and right. Um, so it's, it's pretty great. So here's Sense Perception. Enjoy. welcome to Moody Institute of Science. For several years here at the laboratory, we've been studying the human senses. And the deeper we go into the subject, the more fascinating and wonderful it becomes. As we explore the mysteries of sense perception together, we're going to have a lot of fun. There'll be some surprises and quite a few chuckles. But also, we're going to discover that there is real significance in the study. How many senses are there? Well, more than the traditional five, a lot more. But it's not without reason that these five have been called the windows of the soul. The sense of sight, which opens to us all the beauty and wonder of the world around us. sense of hearing and the many voices of the world. The sense of taste with its endless delight. Oh yes, and that wonderful sense of smell. The sense of touch with hands both young and old. Viewing the senses individually, we find that they are wonderful indeed. But our senses don't function independently. They operate together as a team, forming a smoothly integrated complex electronic system. Let's watch this system work at a baseball game. Nice catch. But let's take a closer look at the electronic magic behind that catch. At the instant the ball was hit, countless bits of information were flashed to the outfielder's brain. His eyes told him the angle at which the bat hit the ball and the direction it was starting to travel. His ears told him how squarely and how hard the ball was hit. His sense of touch gave him clues as to wind direction and velocity. 
And from his memory came thousands of clues gained through past experience. This information was combined to solve a complex problem involving geometry, trigonometry, calculus, and ballistics. And he makes the catch. In a single day of normal activity, it is probable that the sensory system of your body will handle more messages than have been carried by all the telephone and telegraph lines in the whole world during the past 50 years. The human senses are wonderful, and they serve their intended purpose as well, but for the world around us, they are extremely limited. Let's take the sense of sight, for example. Now, our eyes are sensitive to a particular range of frequencies which we call visible light. But visible light is merely a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which includes electric waves, radio waves, infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma, and cosmic rays. Now, in a very real sense, all of this is light. But nearly all of it is light we cannot see. These frequencies have special meaning for us merely because they are the ones to which our eyes will respond. Now, of course, electric waves and radio waves have different properties because they're different wavelengths. But that same thing is true of any part of the spectrum. Even in the visible spectrum, there are different wavelengths which have different properties. In the electromagnetic spectrum, the longest waves are the electric waves, which commonly supply us with power. Electric waves are some 3,000 miles in length. But as they become shorter and vibrate faster, they gradually merge into radio waves. The longer radio waves we pick up on our standard broadcast receivers. For shorter waves, we have to use shortwave receivers, television sets, various radar systems. But as the waves become shorter and vibrate still faster, we move into the infrared section. These waves cannot be tuned in on our radio or TV sets. Instead, we tune them in on our bodies and call them heat. Wavelengths of invisible infrared light are so close to the longest waves of visible light that often both can be detected at the same time. Moving across the visible spectrum, the waves become shorter and vibrate faster until finally visible violet disappears into invisible ultraviolet, sometimes called black light. Now, ultraviolet rays are too short and vibrate too fast for the human eye to see, but there are ways we can see their effects. Sunburn, for instance, is caused by invisible ultraviolet light. Some minerals can change invisible ultraviolet light into frequencies we can see. Rather ordinary looking, aren't they? Well, now let's shine some invisible ultraviolet light on them. Instantly, they flame into glowing beauty as short waves of invisible ultraviolet light are sent back as longer waves, which we can see. Traveling farther down the spectrum, we come to X-rays. Of course, our eyes are not sensitive to X-ray light, but photographic film is, a fact made use of every day in medical laboratories. So in reality, we who think we see so much are groping around in a world ablaze with glory and wonder and light and color, and we're almost totally blind. Now, does this mean that our sense of sight is any less amazing and wonderful than we had supposed? Not at all. It merely means that the universe around us is infinitely more wonderful than anything of which we've ever dreamed. Now, all of us have heard someone say, I will not believe in anything that I cannot see with my own two eyes. Well, the very least that you can say about such a person is that he must have a narrow view of the world around him. Yes, our vision certainly is limited. But how about the sense of hearing? Is it also limited? Well, did you ever hear one of these? Quiet, isn't it? No, not really. This is an ultrasonic dog whistle. Actually, the sound is very loud. A dog can hear it all over the neighborhood. But it's beyond the range of the human ear. Now, we've built a 
super high-powered dog whistle. In the science laboratory, it's called a Galton whistle, after Sir Francis Galton, who invented it. The whistle is now blowing full blast. Though completely inaudible to us, it is a tremendous intensity. In fact, it is so loud that the sound can actually be used to support objects in midair. The silent sound from the whistle is bounced back and forth to form a standing wave pattern. These waves whip the air molecules into a stormy sea of violent motion except at two points in each wave. It's at these points, or nodes, that the cork chips are suspended. This world of silent sound brings man face to face with a realm far beyond the narrow limits of the human senses. Now before the molecular nature of matter was known, the sense of smell and to a lesser degree that of taste were almost a complete mystery. Knowledge, however, has not lessened the wonder of these so-called chemical senses. It has merely enabled us in some small degree to appreciate their wonder. Now any substance is composed of invisible particles called molecules. These particles are in continuous movement. In some substances the movement is so violent that particles near the surface go shooting off into the air. This is what gives a substance an odor. Dramatic proof of this may be had by uh, pouring some mercury into a dish. and then carefully sprinkling the surface of the mercury with a fine powder. Now, if we bring a substance with a strong odor close to the surface of the top, the powder will be pushed violently away by the invisible particles coming from the substance. Man has devised instruments so sensitive that they can detect one part of a substance in 10 million parts of air. Your olfactory organs, however, can detect one part in a thousand million. But compared to that of many animals, man's sense of smell is quite limited. The bloodhound, for instance, has the extraordinary ability to follow a scent when it's hours or even days old. But perhaps the most limited sense of all is the sense of taste. Yes, even the man who prides himself on a very discriminating sense of taste is limited like the rest of us to just four kinds of taste buds. Salt, sweet, sour, and bitter. Did you know that if a person is blindfolded, with his nasal passages completely blocked, he can't tell the difference between an onion, an apple, a pear, or a potato? It's a fact. It's only the odor that makes the flavor different. As we began our study of the mysteries of sense perception, one of the first things we had to recognize is the fact that we do not see with our eyes or hear with our ears. These are merely the external receptors. The real seat of sense perception is in the brain. It is here that we see and hear and detect odors and taste our food and otherwise sense the world around us. And it's a good thing that this is so. For example, if seeing were done only in the eye, everything would be upside down to us. The eye is actually a miniature camera. Just as in a camera, the lens of the eye forms the image upside down. The image is then inverted by the brain so that it appears right side up. Now, what would happen if a lens system were used to form the image right side up. Well, the brain would immediately invert the image so that it would be upside down. But would this condition be permanent? To answer this question, we asked Mr. Gratz, our optical expert, to design for us a pair of inverting spectacles. While the spectacles were being constructed in our shop, we faced the problem of who was going to wear the things continuously for several weeks. So we decided to have an election. And now, you'll want to meet our unlucky winner. That's right, me.
Even from the first, it was possible to walk in this topsy-turvy fashion. But it didn't take long to develop a rollicking case of seasickness. We decided that for your sake as well as ours, we'd better conduct our first test sitting down. However, just sitting down wasn't so easy. Even the simplest tasks were at first impossible. No amount of concentration or effort could overcome the compulsion to reach in the wrong direction. The inverting spectacles had to be worn every waking moment during the entire period of the experiment. Anytime the glasses were removed, the eyes were closed or fully covered. Walking to work upside down was an exhausting experience but it provided a valuable period of relearning and reorientation. It also caused quite a stir in the neighborhood. Gradually, it became easier to get around in this upside-down world. By a slow and painful process, the image in the brain had been erected. At this point, we decided to devise a convincing demonstration showing that reorientation had been achieved. The test with the motorcycle went so well that we decided to extend the experiment to flying an airplane, where visual coordination and depth perception are even more critical. flight lasted more than an hour, during which all normal flight maneuvers were executed. In performing the experiment with the inverting spectacles, we became very much aware of how important it is that seeing is done in the brain, not just in the eye. When you look at a brick wall, for example, staring straight ahead with one eye closed, there is a hole in the picture image sent to your brain. The hole is irregular in shape and occurs 12 degrees to one side. However, try as you will, you won't be able to see the hole. Your mind will fill in the missing detail brick by brick. But why is the blind spot there in the first place? The answer lies in the amazing construction of the eye. The inner curved surface at the rear of the eye, called the retina, is a fantastic thing. Its function is to transform a visual image into electrical impulses which are collected by a network of more than one million tiny nerve lines which carry the visual image to the brain. The blind spot occurs at that point in the retina where the nerve lines join the optic nerve. At this point, there are no seeing elements. Now, it's a good thing that this spot is not in the center of the retina, for if it were, our vision would have been seriously impaired. As it is, however, the hole is always there in the image sent to the brain, but the brain always fills in the hole with detail similar to that which surrounds it. But someone says, well, maybe I don't see everything around me, but if what I do see I see correctly, I'll still trust my senses. Well, recently there has been a great deal of careful research and study into the subject of the accuracy of the senses, and uh, the results have been quite amazing. The scientist, Adelbert Ames, has developed some ingenious experiments. In this figure, the two ends obviously are parallel, but the two sides are not parallel because the two ends are not the same length. This figure we call a trapezoid. Now let's remove the cover. Are you a bit confused? Well, all we've done is cut some holes in the figure and painted it to look like a window frame. But maybe you say, well, you can't fool me. That's still a trapezoid. Well, it's still a trapezoid, all right. But now let's revolve the figure and see what happens. 
Does the window frame seem to turn, then stop, and reverse directions? Well, such is not the case. It is revolving continuously in a clockwise direction. Now, even when we know this, the illusion still persists, and it looks more like a window all the time. Well, maybe you need a reference point. See if the cube will help you follow the edge of the trapezoid all the way around. Watch closely now. Doesn't help a bit, does it? Not only does the trapezoid still oscillate back and forth, but the cube actually seems to take off and go floating through space. Now, it doesn't, of course. Actually, the cube has been firmly attached to the edge of the figure all the time. Now, an iron bar should make a good solid reference point. Let's see what happens now when we rotate the window. Of course, we know that the revolving window frame cannot possibly bend the iron bar or cause it to cut through the window frame. But this knowledge seems to be of no help at all. The illusion of an oscillating window still continues. From earliest childhood, it has been our experience that windows are rectangles and that all sides are parallel. Your eye sent an accurate image to the brain, the image of a trapezoid painted like a window. But your mind said, ah, that's a window. And rather than give up the idea that all windows are rectangular, your mind accepted all sorts of improbable things, solid bars bending or cutting through solid matter without even leaving a hole. We emphasize the fact that seeing is done in the mind, not just the eye. And I think you're beginning to see the importance of this emphasis. But Adelbert Ames, had some other experiments which were most revealing. Now, as I step into this room, it should be quite obvious that something is wrong, but can you figure out what it is? Your mind may tell you that I have grown smaller. Of course, you know that that really isn't true. Your eyes, however, are telling you the truth. They're telling you that the floor is tilted up, that the ceiling is tilted down, that the walls are badly distorted that the windows would be almost impossible to make drapes for them. Yes, your eye is telling you all this, but your mind simply refuses to believe it. But maybe this will help. Imagine all of this without benefit of vitamins. But it also works the other way, too. Now, if you'll just step back a bit, you'll see the real cause of the trouble. It's quite obvious at this distance, isn't it? Sloping floor, tilted ceiling, distorted walls. But uh, since you understand this, you shouldn't have a bit of trouble from now on, should you? Or should you? In this house, faces at the window seem to come in assorted sizes, don't they? But uh, there's nothing wrong with the faces. It's those windows and what they're doing to your brain, remember? A small one and a tall one. Let's see if we can even things out a bit. Oh no, that's even worse. It comes as a distinct shock to most people when they realize how limited and how inaccurate the human senses really are. Now, of course, the scientist is keenly aware of these limitations. In fact, this awareness is the very foundation of modern science. Before the age of science, man had no real concept of an orderly universe governed by unchanging law. He proudly built his theories and philosophies on the meager scraps of information coming from his limited and inaccurate senses. This was a time when alchemists mixed their magic potions, when astrologers tried to predict the future, when phrenologists measured bumps on the head to gauge a man's intelligence. But about 300 years ago, the picture began to change.
the age of science was born when man quit trusting his senses and developed instruments to overcome their limitations. Today man knows that the physical world is governed by universal and unchanging law that has been operating since time began. Man knows that there is rich reward for strict detailed obedience to physical law and also a stern penalty for disobedience. He knows that sincerity and good intentions are not enough. Now this attitude in the scientific realm is relatively new, but it certainly has paid off. As soon as man adopted this attitude, there was a sharp upturn, literally an explosion in scientific progress. And yet, with all the potential for good, this scientific development has brought man face to face with the greatest crisis in human history. And why do we face this crisis? Is it because scientific knowledge has grown too rapidly and too extensively? No, not at all. Obviously, scientific advancement must continue. It would be both foolish and dangerous to lag behind. And yet it would be far more foolish and dangerous to lag behind in our capacity to use this knowledge wisely. We must develop a sense of moral and spiritual responsibility so that the fruits of scientific progress may be devoted to life instead of death. Now if man is to survive, man must change. In other words, there must be a moral and spiritual breakthrough every bit as revolutionary as the one we've experienced in science. And I'd like to suggest that such a breakthrough is entirely possible, and that both the problem and the solution have a definite parallel in the history of science. Now, for thousands of years, there was virtually no scientific progress. And then suddenly, something happened. There was literally an explosion in scientific development and the curve is getting steeper all the time. But what caused this change? Well, obviously the physical universe didn't change suddenly. And we can't explain the situation by saying that man is smarter now than he was then. His IQ is probably very much the same. There was, however, a very basic change in man's attitude. During this period, man was committed to trusting his senses. And the result? Virtually no scientific progress. But then man woke up. He began to search out the laws of the physical universe. And as fast as he discovered them, he obeyed them. He accepted their restraint and their discipline. And for the first time in history, he was free. Free from bondage to ignorance and superstition and unworkable philosophies and theories. And the result? an explosive progress. But how about the moral and spiritual realm? In this realm, man seems to feel that there are no absolute values and no fixed laws, so once again he is committed to trusting himself, his own ideas, his own theories and philosophies. And what's the result? Virtually no progress. Now judging from our experience in the scientific world, it would seem that once again, we're on the wrong track. But let's suppose that the young people of today recognize the need for a breakthrough in this the most important realm of all. Let us suppose that they recognize the existence of absolute values and fixed laws and that they set themselves to obeying those laws with all of the dedication and the honesty and the energy which they bring to the scientific task. What will be the result? An explosive change. A surge in moral and spiritual strength to match our progress in science and to give meaning and purpose to our lives. I, I really... I love the Moody Institute of Science films. Now, not all of them are this good. Um, and I especially like the ones involving Dr. Erwin Moon when he, uh, he places himself or somebody else at the Moody Institute in some sort of harm's way. Uh, an example of that, of course, is the 
Electric Eel film that I showed a couple of months ago where he brings in his staff and they all touch the eel in, in a pair in series and all get a shock. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, you know, the religious uh, hook at the end is it's not great, but whatever. But I would say that, um, you know, this uh, Moody Institute of Science... Uh, Bell Science Series and uh, Mr. Wizard on television. All three of them uh, introduced science to a whole generation of kids who became scientists because of what they saw. Um, and none of those men were scientists at all. Um, Dr. Frank Baxter was had an uh, English PhD, and Frank Herbert, the not Frank Herbert, what's his name? Um, Frank something Herbert. Anyways, he was just a TV guy. Um, but they all had a hobby interest in science. Um, although I don't know if Frank Baxter even had a hobby interest in science. I think that he just, he was doing public television things about Shakespeare, and they were like, you're great. You have a great rapport with your audiences. Um, we should do these Bell Science films. All right, one last film, and it's a cartoon. It's called The Fatal Compromise. <laughs> Such a great uh, film. I'm not gonna moral moralize or uh, it's a, it's a great film, no matter what. Um, so people are gonna ask. This is uh, Greg Fischel, who was a former weatherman um, in Raleigh, who has now since moved on to Florida. Um, but uh, <laughs> I love that film. Uh, yeah, so thanks guys for tuning in today. Uh, very much appreciate the coffee and the, the comments and you guys um, pulling out the dog whistle and the sheeple references. <laughs> you, 
You can't escape it, man. It's, it's pop culture. Uh, so if you like what you saw, please uh, like, subscribe, buy us some coffee if you feel like you'd like to do that. Go to avgeeks.com. You can see other things that we've done. Uh, you know, and share what we do. Tell your friends, family, what we're up to. Uh, that always, it's always great to see new faces. It's it's great to see um, the people that have been here since the beginning. But always nice to see people going, what is this? <laughs> what am I watching? Why am I watching this? <laughs> or how did I get here? Uh, those are those are comments I I relish every day. Um, and also, uh, if you haven't voted yet, please vote. Just go for it. Uh, and if you know what day it is, you'll realize that that's way off. Uh, it is October 19th. So, um, time's wasting. Um, but uh, I didn't get a chance to show this last time because I was... What was I doing? But uh, this is the remix um, cover of Shake Hands with Danger that my wife uh, paid my uh, a friend of ours who's a singer-songwriter to do. So here's... Shake hands with danger, kind of the dance version. Take care. I can check that gear in a minute, so don't touch anything, okay? Hey! Get down from there! What if it bumped that control by accident? You'd be mincemeat by now. What have I told you? You don't work on equipment when the engine's running. Well, I told him not to touch anything. All right, I guess I wasn't thinking. You weren't thinking? You mean you'll work on engines and machinery and not think of your own personal safety? Here, shake hands with danger. a man you ought to know. I used to laugh at safety, but now they call me <laughs> Three Finger Joe. I was young and feisty, never did things by the book. Just let me get my tool box and I'll take myself a look. I climbed up on a dozier with my mechanic's pride. Said you can keep it running, friend, while I poke around inside. Shake hands with danger, meet a guy you ought to know. I used to laugh at safety, now they call me <coughs> Three Fingered Joe. Although I learned a lesson, I forgot it soon enough. The nicks and burns and scratches showed the young ones I was tough. Till another morning I was grinding on some steel My other hand got careless and fed my skin into the wheel Shake hands with danger, step right up and say hello Grinding wheels and metal are what made me a three-fingered Joe I've seen mechanics burning and I've seen them take a fall just to save themselves a minute I've seen them lose it all I've watched them courting trouble Seen them take a chance and lose They get careless for a moment And spend a lifetime with the blues
Just as a reminder, uh, we look inside the film can for advice. It tells us to love each other. Please rewind. Uh, peace sign and um, a smiley face with eyelashes. So everybody, have a good rest of your Monday, and we will see you tomorrow, 1 o'clock. Thanks again, everybody. Bye.